It's certainly a pleasure for me to participate in this symposium, and I'm going to talk to you about active surveillance. Uh, active surveillance is the preferred form of treatment for early stage prostate cancer. Uh, I'd like to start out by thanking a whole group of people who actually helped me put this together. It's taken a lot of uh, many years and a great deal of work. Uh, for disclosure, I'm a very busy surgeon. I think prostate cancer over detection and diagnosis are problems. I also think, as you'll hear from the symposium, that under treatment is also a problem. The information I will share with you is largely my own, and I will try and walk you through it. Active surveillance is a response to the over detection and treatment of prostate cancer brought about by widespread and repeated PSA screening that occurred in the mid 90s. Its uptake by urologists helped pave the way for a better assessment by the task force on the early detection of prostate cancer. Again, the objectives are to avoid or delay the cost of treatment without compromising cancer cure, and it's compliant with all major screening and treatment guidelines. And again, as I'll show you, it's about timing of treatment. Even though some men require treatment, do they need that treatment right now? And the data I'll show you is based on about 2,000 patients who have consented for research. Their average age is about 62. PSA 5.6, most of these men had low grade disease, at least in 3.3, but about 15% had higher grade disease. And the average follow-up has been over six years. Some followed for 20 years and some recently accrued to this trial. This is the upgrade free survival rates on surveillance. Again, these are, these are curves showing you that about seven years out, that about half the patients will show some change in grade or volume on serial biopsy. So these men to go with periodic imaging, PSA, and biopsy. However, treatment rates are much, much better. So only about one in three men with low grade disease require treatment of seven years, and about 50% of those with higher grade disease. And the reason for this is most of these changes in, in volume or grade are rather subtle or small. Only about one in three change is clinically significant. What about outcomes after delayed radical prostatectomy? I think we have the largest series of men who've been on surveillance who underwent surgery. And about 35% will have what we call adverse pathology, higher grade disease or disease beyond the prostate. But if you look, PSA free recurrence or second treatment free recurrence rates are, are very similar to what you'd expect by early treatment. What predicts for metastases? We've looked at this, the overall survival rate in our cohort is 97%. Prostate cancer specific survival, excellent at 99.7%. About 1% of patients develop metastases, mostly nodal metastases. What predicted for this are higher grade tumors, more rapid PSA changes, and uh, PIRAD scores of four or five at diagnosis. So again, more adverse imaging results. What you need to consider if surveillance is right for you, well, something called PSA density, PSA divided by the gland volume, what stage of cancer you have, what the grade is, volume, PIRAD score, genomics, of course, age and health of the patient, and very importantly, patient and family preferences, and whether or not you have confidence in your providers. What about new technology? There are new genomic markers. Again, we take the biopsy material, see how it expresses certain genes. There's three commercial assays that are used most often, Decipher, Oncotype, Prolaris. We've used all of them. This is simply an example by Matt Cooperberg here, Eric Klein and myself, large study. And what I'm showing you here is a likelihood of favorable pathology on biopsy uh, by CAPRA score. Again, CAPRA score is a way to assess risk. Low CAPRA score is quite variable, but you see on these curves here, when you add a genomic score to this, you increase or decrease the likelihood of favorable pathology. So this is telling you that genomic scores are adding additional prognostic information. We have shown that the GPS score oncotype, again, same thing with the cipher Polaris, does predict for upgrading and maybe a biochemical recurrence after delayed surgery. Uh, but very importantly, this is a waterfall plot. And I'm going to show you here, these, these are all patients, you know, one through 271. Blue shows those patients who were upgraded and red is uh, no upgrade. So you can see that as you increase genomic scores, a higher chance of progression. But we see some patients with, with, with favorable scores that progress and some with unfavorable scores that do not progress. So again, there's no GPS score, no genomic score that completely excludes or predicts pro progression. But again, one more bit of information to use when you assess risk. Other biomarkers, again, one very easy one is PSA density a PSA density below 0.15. Again, PSA divided by gland volume, 
below 0.15 tends to predict for non-progression. A higher PSA density leads us to believe there may be something else going on in the prostate that was not recognized. Negative biopsy, about one in five patients who undergo serial biopsy will have a negative biopsy. Again, either one or more negative biopsies obviously predicts for non-progression. MRI, again, this is a very nice MRI showing a large shadow on the right side of the prostate, uh, demonstrated in the error there, a lot of interest here. I just want to show you that in our experience, about 38% of men will show a change in PIRAD score, again, uh, the, over time on surveillance. PIRADS 4 or 5, or an increase in PIRADS, predicts for upgrading. So again, we use MRI quite heavily at the time of diagnosis and in follow-up. But can you exclude a biopsy based on MRI alone? Well, the answer is no. So the negative predictive value of an MRI is around 78 to 80 percent. That means you'll miss about 15 to 20 percent of higher risk tumors if you don't biopsy those patients with a negative MRI. Now, just simply add PSA density to that and you can increase the negative predictive value to over 90%. So don't use MRI alone, but use it in context of another biomarker, PSA density being one of them. Controversies, age, ethnicity, and grade. It turns out that younger patients actually have a slower rate of progression compared to older patients. So we think the younger patients, many of whom have not completed their families are candidates for active surveillance. And there's no significant association between age and time to treatment or biochemical recurrence following delayed radical prostatectomy. What about Gleason grade three, four? It turns out that three, four alone does not predict for progression. It's actually volume of the three, four. So those with low volume three, four showed no increased risk of progression or biochemical failure. One thing you should be looking at, paying a lot of attention to now, is something called histologic subtype of pattern four. Not all cells are the same. Uh, and we have shown that those men with cribriform histology and stromal reaction are associated with higher genomic scores and a higher risk of adverse pathology or higher risk tumor. So when you get that pathology report back and you have a pattern four cell noted on that, you want to know the histologic subtype. It's thought that BRCA2 uh, mutations may, may be a predict for progression. Still a lot of uh, work being done there. Uh, African-American men, a lot of controversy here in the Canary series that both Matt and I participated in. We saw no difference uh, in reclassification rates between black and white men. But I wanna point out that African-American men make up a small percentage of men on surveillance and race may be a poor surrogate of social constructs or biology. A lot of controversy about race related research currently and I think Mac will address this. We may need to make it less burdensome. Nice work by uh, Peter Lonigan showed that, that uh, we can actually take patients and determine who's at risk for uh, progression, follow them more carefully. Those with lower risk don't need uh, as frequent a biopsy and some don't need any biopsy at all. But a high genomic score, high PSA density, adverse MRI, these patients uh, are candidates for uh, more careful follow-up. So again, if you have three, four high volume, high genomics, pyreds four or five, cribriform histology, either consider treatment or early confirmatory biopsy. Obviously, men in poor health should undergo just simply watchful waiting, but a less intense evaluation uh, is appropriate in men with a low PSA density, negative biopsy at any time, favorable histology, and favorable MRI and genomics, and or genomics. So in conclusion, these are the predictors of upgrading. Age, again, older age uh, associated with higher risk tumors. PSA density, a PSA density below 0.15 is protective. Above that, uh, tends to predict for progression. High genomic scores, whether it's GPS or Decipher. PIRADS 4 or 5 predicts for progression higher volume grade group two disease. Uh, and again, those who have negative biopsies have a lower risk of progression over time. So this is a summary of all the features that you would look at when you try and determine what your risk of upgrading is on surveillance. So in summary, active surveillance is a preferred form of treatment for men with very low, low risk and selected patients with favorable intermediate risk disease. New technology, MRI, genomics, and things that come will make it safer. There's a strong interest in lifestyle management in this group of patients and many others. Unfortunately, this use remains highly variable, high rates of surveillance here in the Bay Area, low in other areas of the country, it concerns us. And as you will hear, uh, surveillance may be challenged by forms of focal therapy. Many of these patients 
uh, could be candidates for focal ablation. I'd like to uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm available for questions. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Carroll. Um, I think Dr. Carroll is still uh, caught up with, with, with another uh, commitment. So I'm gonna call on Dr. Cooperberg. Matt, you need to unmute, please, um, with a couple of questions. So first and foremost, Matt, could you please describe what a PIRAD score is and how it's used? And if you, do, if you don't mind, how it's used both as it pertains to active surveillance, but also as it pertains to the decision to biopsy, because I was asked earlier. Yeah, absolutely. And I should have defined that in uh, when I mentioned it earlier. PIRADS is a means of standardizing radiology reports from a multi-parametric MR. Um, when I talked about MR earlier, we didn't really have time to get into the nuances of what goes into a multi-parametric exam, but the radiologists are looking at different types of uh, MR, you know, magnetic application to the prostate tissue. So we got a whole bunch of different sequences, different ways of looking at the prostate tissue um, in the MR magnet. And uh, there are typically literally dozens of sets of images that come out of the machine and different centers have lots of different subtleties in the way they program a multi-parametric MR, which is one of the reasons that it's that for MR specifically, it's really important to be at a very high volume radiology center like ours. There's huge variation in the quality of MR, not just in terms of the radiologist reading it, but even how well the machine is calibrated and customized to do prostate MR. So it's not like getting a CAT scan of the kidneys, which is pretty much the same no matter where you go. Uh, prostate MR is very center specific. So PIRADS is an attempt to standardize this very complicated and complex information. Um, and it's a nationally agreed upon standard whereby PIRAD scores one and two are considered normal. One is completely normal, two is BPH only. Three means it's equivocal whether or not there may be a high grade cancer there. High grade being Gleason grade group two or higher. So ignoring the Gleason grade group ones. Uh, PIRADS four means there is probably a high grade cancer present and PIRADS five uh, means the radiologist is fairly sure there's going to be a, a, a high grade cancer present on biopsy. Now the problem is, as I showed you earlier, there is a huge variation from radiologist to radiologist in assigning PIRADS scores. And this is true in the best centers in the world. So, you know, there is that heterogeneity that we always need to keep in mind. And that's one of the reasons uh, most of us are not comfortable making final decisions based on MRI alone. MRI, as I said, and, and Dr. Carroll alluded to as well, is a great augment and adjunct to biopsy. It helps us do better biopsies. Uh, now, whether we can use it to replace biopsies, so that's that's the pre-diagnostic question. So, you know, and, and you, you may read, depending on what you read, in the UK, for example, you do not get a prostate biopsy anymore with an elevated PSA unless there is a lesion on imaging. Um, there's something to be said for that. The UK, they are no longer finding low-risk prostate cancer, and that's a good thing, but there is definitely a pool of patients with higher-risk cancers who are going undetected, and that's sort of a, a decision. Uh, most of us would argue MR is not there in terms of accuracy for ruling out a first biopsy. In terms of MRI and active surveillance, our approach, we, are, we, we really do rely on a confirmatory biopsy, Dr. Carroll alluded to this, uh, within the first year after the diagnostic biopsy to make sure we have not missed anything worse. Now, after that, if the MRI is clean, is negative, pyrides one or two, and the biopsy is reassuring, and we get another MRI two years down the road, and that is again completely reassuring, we are starting to, th to think in terms of delaying or avoiding some of those downstream biopsies. But that gets very much tailored, very much customized, depending on the details of an individual patient's uh, course. Thanks, Matt. Um, let me ask you one more question, uh, which is, can you speak a little bit, uh, and Dr. Carroll did, did begin to address it, you know, clearly active surveillance in men with low, very low Gleason scores, you know, three plus threes are important. Can you just summarize sort of how a patient, what patient with a Gleason three plus four yeah. uh, biopsy should even consider AS? Yeah, great question. So I, yeah, so it's, it's, it's nice to be able to say, as Dr. Carl said in his first slide in 2021, that surveillance is the standard of care for Gleason 3 plus 3. Um, you know, it's not 100%, but we should be putting 99% of men with Gleason 3 plus 3, maybe 95% on 
active surveillance. So our frontier now is really figuring out which of the three plus fours matter. Um, and as, as Dr. Carroll's talk summarized, some of the factors, we're looking at things like the extent of pattern four. So three plus four means anywhere from 5% to 45% uh, of the cancer being high grade. Um, so obviously the ones where there is almost half the cancer being pattern four, that's more aggressive than if it's only 5%. We are now subtyping the, the pattern four. So the pathologists have a few different patterns that they look at under the microscope, which they will assign within the category pattern four. And some of those are more aggressive than others. So the so-called fused gland um, and poorly formed gland subtypes behave biologically very similar to the Gleason grade group ones, the three plus threes. Whereas others, you will see terms like cribriform, expansile cribriform, intraductal. These are all still within the category of pattern four, but we know they are more aggressive biologically and probably less suitable for active surveillance. And this is where the genomics really are useful clinically, I think is in tiebreaker situations where there is um, you know, more than a tiny speck of three plus four, or even in some cases, a very high volume three plus three, um, where we are really on the fence or the patient's on the fence as to whether to do surveillance or treatment. This is where the markers can be very helpful in, in terms of breaking that tie. Thanks, Matt. Um, and we're not really going to have time to speak about this uh, elsewhere. So maybe just briefly, a few words on focal therapy yep. and what's coming. Uh, we, didn't, I, we intentionally did not allot time to it in this, in this year's symposium because it's developing, but maybe you can speak to it just briefly. I do have one minute of my 10 minutes on surgery that I, that I devoted to focal at the end of the talk coming up. Um, oh, so maybe I'll table a little bit. Why don't, why don't we come back to the question and see if there's still a question after, because I do have a little bit of uh, discussion. Perfect. Thank you. Okay.